Thank you, Victor. That's, you're going to make me cry standing back there. Oh my gosh, that was really, uh, that was really beautiful. And I'll, I'll share with you, I think, the, the incident that he's talking about. But first of all, I wanted to just talk to you for a moment. And being on the stage at Trinity is so exciting to me on a, on a very personal level because my, great, my grandmother, her name was Indiana Davidson, and she graduated from Trinity University when she was 59 years old. Isn't that awesome? I know, that's so awesome. That was 40 years ago. And what was so incredible about this woman is that, and in so many, so many ways, is that she was one of the first bilingual educators she taught, she taught um, Spanish, but she taught Hispanic children, she taught them English. Little white-haired lady, one of the first in the, in the state, and she did pass away several years ago, but up until the time that she died, she still taught. She taught, still, still taught children, and it was really passionate. She was very passionate about that, and the thing that I learned from her is I learned that giving back to society is the rent that we pay for living on this planet. And I didn't realize that that was the lesson I got from her, but my life has, has taken, that, has taken that, that, that way. And the, the incident that, uh, that Victor was talking about, I'll just, I, I'm gonna share some, some, just be really personal with y'all today and share some things with you that I don't share with anybody and that it's, it's painful to talk about but I feel like it's really important for you to understand this. But the incident that, that Victor was talking about was I, I was working in corporate, and I had worked in the telecommunications industry for about 25 years. And one day I was flying throughout the country. I was, doing, I was flying all over Canada, the and, well, all over the United States and Canada, and I had this epiphany. And it was like, you know what? I could be flying and fall out of the sky one of these days when I'm going on to the conference, and what difference does it make that I ever walked this earth? And I went, I can't do this anymore. My family thought I was crazy, but you'll see that that's a theme in my life, okay? A lot of times my family thinks I'm crazy, but they just, they don't get it. They're, they're learning now, you know, there she goes again, there she goes again. So, but I had this epiphany, it's like, I could fall out of the sky one of these days, what difference does it make that I walked on this earth? I quit my job, left a lot of money on the table. I was earning, I was very fortunate. I was earning six figures. And, um, and I just, I quit. And I did a lot of soul searching and a lot of praying for like a year. And what I did is I joined the board of directors for the Batter Women's Shelter, not really understanding why I was so, so passionate about it. And then I went to work for them. And then I had an opportunity in 2002 to co-found an organization called Dress for Success. And I feel incredibly, incredibly passionate about the work that we do at Dress for Success. And we are a, we're a nonprofit, we're a workforce development agency. We, I'm gonna let y'all in on a little secret. We're not a clothing closet, okay? We have very little to do with clothing. We do give clothing away, we, we do, but it's actually as a tool to, it's something that the clients need anyway to go get that job, and I'm going to go more into that here in just a few minutes. But what I'm going to share with you is why do I do Dress for Success, okay? And why am I so incredibly, incredibly passionate about this organization, so passionate that for the first year, I did it for nothing and not got paid one cent. And I'm single, and I don't have another job, okay? So that's, this is another incident where my family thought I was absolutely crazy. They were like, they kept telling me, Pamela, you've got to do something else. You've got to bring income. And I said, you know what? This is a calling. I am not going to stop doing this. I have to do this. This organization is too important. And over my dead body will I close this organization. So I just kept doing it. Finally, the community caught up, I think. And my family eventually did quit, th quit thinking I was crazy. But anyway, the reason I'm so incredibly passionate about Dress for Success is because my personal mission it's a, couple of, it's a couple of things, actually. One is I want to help women find their voice. And I also have wanted to change the economic horizon of San Antonio because we have so much poverty here. We have a lot of generational poverty. And the finding the voice stems back from an incident that happened to me about 20 years ago. And 
I will never forget this, and hopefully I can get through it without tearing up, <laughs> but I was at a mall. I was, I was in a very, very abusive relationship. My husband uh, had tried five times to kill me, and I was at, we were at a mall, and I can't really remember what exactly happened, but I, I was terrified, and I, I jumped out of the truck. I wanted to get away from him, and I was running, and he chased me down in the pickup truck, almost ran over me, and then he jumped out, and he went to grab me. And I was, I was not in my right mind at all. I was totally hysterical. I was screaming, kicking, fighting, biting, cussing, you name it. I mean, really a hysterical, hysterical woman here. And he just picked me up and threw me in the truck. And I was like, that wasn't even the worst part, though, okay? The worst part was that I looked around, and there were all these people standing there, and not one person helped me. Nobody. And I can remember thinking, I have no voice. And it didn't matter what he did to me. It was not as bad as that moment in time. It was not as bad. So we're going to, I'm going to share with you another story that, because I want to, I want to squelch, um, another misconception about battered women, because I hear the question all the time, why doesn't she leave? Why doesn't she leave? One night, the police came to our house, and this was, um, they came to our house a lot, okay? My daughter would, would call the police all the time. And the interesting thing is that the police, and this was not here in San Antonio, this was another state, but one of the incidents, it was interesting to me how they never separated us. So whenever, the, I knew the police were coming and I would, tell my husband, you know, or my husband would tell me, you better be careful what you say, and I would say to him, well, you know, they've got guns. He said, I don't care, you'll be dead first. <laughs> I was like, oh, excuse me. Um, and so I knew, I knew, I knew what I could say and what I couldn't say. And so when the police would, one night when the police came, and I didn't, I don't understand why they took this action that night. I, I suspect they saw something with him that they, that it was more serious and they realized that this time he really was going to kill me. And so they took us out of the house. What, first of all, they called the battered women's shelter at that state, in the state, and they wouldn't take us, me or my two children, they would not take us. And they, however, the police would not leave us in the house. They said, for whatever reason, they had already taken all the guns out, but they said, you're not staying, so you, you've got to come. So my father-in-law gave me some money, and the police took us to a hotel, because of course the shelter was not an option. And um, the next morning, I, I, I want you all to think for a minute, and see if you can figure out what did I do. What did I do the next day? Got any idea? I went back. You betcha I did. I went back. Now, you might think, is she nuts? Why in the world would she, the police got her out, why in the world would she go back? I can tell you exactly what I was thinking. He had already told me, he said, I will find you no matter where you go. There's no place on this earth that I will not find you. He was a cop, okay? I, I knew he'd have been trained by the FBI. I knew he could find me. And he said, not only, he said, if you ever leave me, he said, not only will I find you and not only will I kill you, but they will never find your body. And so I remember thinking, well, I know he's going to kill me. I already knew that. That was a given because I had left. He had already told me he was going to kill me. And, but I thought at least my father-in-law would see that I was alive and they would know who did it. And that even if, even if he hid me, that they would know who did it. Crazy, I know, so crazy. But I had, no, I had no resources. I had no resources. I had no money. I had no place to go. He had already told all of my friends, any, any of my friends helped me, he was going to kill me. So we fast forward in 2002. I have an opportunity to me that everything that I have gone through has prepared me for Dress for Success. I truly believe that. So when I'm speaking to the clients and I say, I understand. And they're looking at me thinking, yeah, right. 
some white lady's going to tell me Hispanic, minor, you know, or black or whatever. You you know where I'm done, where I'm coming from. It's like, yeah, my husband tried five times to kill me. It's a miracle that I'm here because the statistics were definitely against me. Seventy-five percent of the women who are killed by their partner are murdered when they leave their when they leave him. So I knew I, I'm really fortunate. So I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about dress for success. I want to get you involved in thinking about dress for success, thinking about domestic violence, how can you, because I will tell you we all contribute to this. We all contribute to the domestic violence that's happening in one way or another, and I'll explain that in just a minute. So dress for success, we are working on generational poverty. We, we work with clients who are victims of domestic violence, and, and we'll go into some stats here in just a minute. But what is, a, what is abuse, okay, what is it? It's anything that makes you feel uncomfortable, okay, that where someone is having power and control over you. It could be verbal, it could be emotional, it could be spiritual, sexual, physical. It's not just the physical. That's why I never thought I was a victim of domestic violence because to me, victim of domestic violence was if my husband would have slapped me across the face or something. He didn't, you know, he would, he would keep me locked up, he raped me, he um, would terrorize me, but to me, I never thought I was. And victims of domestic violence often do not, do not think that they are, that they are in those kinds of situations. So if I can't get you involved, and, and I like to say that this issue is, whether you're liberal or conservative, it, it doesn't make any difference. This is an important issue. And the reason being is because if you're liberal, it's the right thing to do, to be involved. If you're conservative, and, and well, actually even more liberal, but if, if you're concerned or you're, or you're an accountant or you're concerned about money or our economy or something, we're spending $8.3 billion a year on the domestic violence issue. In our economy, that's a lot of money. And that pisses me off. I don't know about you. But that's like, that's unacceptable. And between two to four million women a year are abused in the United States. Two to four million. And they have children. And if their children are not being direct, if their children not, are not being abused, with many, many times the children are being abused, they are seeing this abuse and it's perpetuating the cycle. It's perpetuating the cycle. Women of all cultures, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religious preference, it does not matter. No one is immune to domestic violence. Absolutely no one. I don't certainly, I don't think, at least I've been told that I do not look like the typical domestic violence survivor or victim. And people are often, often, um, thank you, are often surprised at whenever I tell them that I, that I am a survivor. And four out of ten ranked fear. So y'all heard from my story at least that fear, it was actually fear and economic distress. So I had no resources and of course I went back. Dress for Success, I am extremely, extremely passionate about the work that we are doing at Dress for Success. Like I was saying, we are not a clothing closet. We are truly a workforce development agency that is having a tremendous economic impact in the city of San Antonio. We, ha we have multiple programs. We have a suiting program, and I start out with a suiting program, although in reality, I like to say, before the women get the goodies, they gotta do some work and the work is they go to the Career Center. We have an AARP certified work search center, and each of those women establish a work search account. We sit down with them, uh, one of my staff members sits down, we d they do a life plan, they talk about education, and then they move to the Career Center, that online assessment as assesses not only the things that they enjoy doing, their work experience, and also their educational level, and from there, we, they get, have an opportunity to get in touch with the things that they really enjoy doing because what we really are about is we really are about affecting the children. We just think the best way to do that is to help the mothers and to make sure the moms are in jobs where they can earn money and that they're staying employed and the sustainability of peace is very, very important. So they start in the suiting program. When they come to us initially, they get an interview suit, so we're dressing for that job interview, but when they get the job, they get to come back, we give them up to five additional looks to start their brand new job because we do not want them spending their money on clothing when they, go, when they get that first paycheck. We're gonna take care of that for them. And then if they're hungry, like I said, we have an emergency food pantry as well. We added a, a new program, it's called the Going Places Network by Walmart. It has been absolutely incredible. 
I'm going to just tell y'all that you can go online and learn more about Dress for Success because my time, I've got like three minutes left. We do financial literacy, professional women's group. I do want to tell y'all, I don't know if this is on here, that in 2009, we were voted, uh, we were the, not, the professional women's group affiliate of the year. This is a worldwide award. It's only given to one affiliate in the entire world. And there are 114 affiliates in 14 countries. Y'all should be proud. I mean, really and truly proud because uh, that, that it took a lot of work to get to do that. And we're this, it's the second international award that we've received. And I've got some, like I said, stats I'm going through here kind of quickly. Uh, we have over 120 different partner agencies, nonprofits and governmental agencies that refer clients to us. And we have a 90% efficiency rate, so which means 90, 90 cents of every dollar that anybody does for us, it goes back into programs to really change lives. We have a, an 80% promotion rate for the professional women's group. This is really what I want to talk to you about. When I was talking to you about three out of four, or 70, about 75% of people know someone who an, an, has been a victim of domestic violence. We all do it. We hear it. We see it. We may, not, we may be turning it out, but we absolutely see it. Action steps that I'm going to ask you to do. First of all, please, please, please do not ask, why doesn't she leave? Please don't ask that. Like I said a few minutes ago, when a woman leaves her battering relationship, her batter, her chances of being murdered increase to 75%. It's a very dangerous time. She's the one who's going to know when it's safe. The question actually is, why doesn't he let her go? Okay? Say words of empowerment to her if you know a victim. Say things like, no one has the right to do that to you. You are an incredible woman. What he's doing is illegal. And encourage her to get to work with a batter women's shelter in the area so that she will have a safety plan, so that it will be safe to leave. The other thing is, if I see it, and if I hear it, it's my problem. I have chased people down on the streets. When I witnessed, oh yeah, it's like 911 should know, pick up the phone and say, hey, Pamela, you again? Because I'm not kidding, I chase people down on the streets, the whole bit, okay? If I see it, it's my problem, and I will report it to the police. I absolutely will. This is a message for men. I know that you have buddies that men talk. Please, 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 men, do not let other men talk badly about women. Please do not do that. Hold them accountable. If, if you hear of a man who's abusing his wife, say, really? That's what being a man is? Oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. And in closing, I just I want to share a parable with you. It's a Baha'i parable. And that parable talks about a bird. And the wings of the bird one wing represents the male, and one wing rep represents the female. And until both wings of the bird are equal, that bird cannot fly. Namaste. Thank you. <laughs>